Boston University Medical School in 2004. He completed his internship and residency at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center and moved to St. Johnsbury and the St. Johnsbury Pediatrics um, Program in 2009. And he is currently the medical director of that practice. And Josh is very committed to uh, community involvement and school nurses. Kathleen Bryant is a family nurse practitioner. She works at Central Vermont um, Medical Center Pediatric Primary Care in Berlin. And she also works in the school-based health center in Barry City Elementary School. And when interviewed about her work there, she stated kids spend a considerable part of their day in school, so providing health care there makes great sense. So again, thank you all for being here. And just a reminder to those of you joining us to put your questions in the chat box and uh, we will get them answered. So my first question is um, for you, Josh, Dr. Josh, um, explain to us about the Kawasaki-like symptoms that we're hearing about in the news and is this going to be a game changer as we go forward when we talk about reopening schools? Uh, great question. I, I'll start with the fact that uh, it's an evolving syndrome, which has some Kawasaki features, toxic shock features. There may be some different medical presentations that um, school nurses would see. Um, to review, um, what you guys should be looking at, um, the symptoms would involve high fever, they would involve potentially rash, um, sore throat. These kids should look sick. So they're not going to come in and say, oh, I'm just feeling a little crummy with a stuffy nose. These are the kids that will walk into your office and you'd expect to say, hmm, I'm worried about these kids. Some of them may present with um, also conjunctivitis, uh, redness to their eyes, um, and some of them may also have gastrointestinal symptoms. So uh, they could have diarrhea, abdominal pain, um, and uh, again, present to you and give you that sense that this is a kid I should be paying attention to. Um, and you know, certainly reach out and talk to your local pediatrician or provider um, if you have any concerns. Uh, the other important piece to this you've probably been following is it seems to be a late onset feature. So that if we saw a number of kids with COVID-19 in our community, it's not something that you would see when they likely get the disease. It would be probably distanced by a few weeks, maybe up to more than a month. Um, and certainly my colleagues can jump in and say what they know. There have been a number of people presenting on the Vermont meetings uh, when we meet at noon talking about this, um, you know, most of the research we have is from New York and other communities where there's been very high volumes of COVID-19. Thank you. Um, Kathleen, do you have anything to add? No, I think the same thing that the research is really evolving and we're learning more and more. And um, I think that it, it's important to remember that this is pretty rare. And so, um, you know, hopefully, we won't be seeing a lot of it, but it's good to just know that um, it could be a problem, but most likely it's gonna be something that is, is more on the rare side and it's a kid that will look very sick. Okay. But we'll learn more in the next few months. Thank you. Dr. Weinberger. Yeah, I don't necessarily have a whole lot to add to that. Um, that's my understanding to the other piece um, that came out of a, a CDC webinar about about this was just, you know, in, in some of the places they looked at, there was a predominance of cases among um, African American kids and Hispanic kids and um, but also that right you know, most of the cases come from really big population centers where they're seeing more kids than we are currently in Vermont with COVID. So we may see it or we may not, but I'm sure we'll learn more about it as we go. 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Weinberger, while we have you at the mic, um, what are some guidelines that you might suggest that we need to reiterate to families regarding uh, changes in your outpatient care? And um, how can we as school nurses help coordinate between the families and the primary care physicians to ensure appointments for well child visits and uh, immunizations are, that are scheduled are kept? Yeah, I mean, so I think as a, as a pediatric community, you know, we feel like um, we have a couple things going on right, right now. You know, one, we want to help families respond to their kids when they're sick, respond to just questions and anxieties around COVID and how to keep families safe and how to keep their kids safe. Um, but at the same time, you know, there are all these ongoing things that kids need to stay healthy. And some of that includes, right, monitoring growth, blood pressure, getting needed vaccinations, um, all those sorts of things, which um, still are really important and, you know, are not things that you want to put off. And so I think, um, you know, one message is that, that we've been iterating to our patients and, you know, is it, please reach out to your pediatrician, you know, call if you have any questions, if you have concerns. Um, remember, you know, general pediatric care is important um, and they may be reaching out to you about that stuff. Um, and then, you know, also a couple other things that we generally iterate to patients, you know, so we've changed how we're doing things and, and um, to try and respond to the situation. Um, and so we're offering both in-person and video care like this. And I think, you know, the majority of practices around Vermont are doing the same. And so, um, but we've also made a lot of changes to our office settings to keep them safe. So things like, you know, many practices are doing masking, taking temperatures um, before folks come in, you know, you may, be screened um, by phone before you come in, just so we can sort of understand how best to meet your needs and keep you safe. Make sure that the clinic is a safe place for all these, um, for all your needs. Um, and so, um, you know, what I try and re reiterate to families is this is really important. We'll work with you. And also we've, we've done a lot to make this a safe place for your needed care. Thank you. I see some nodding heads from our other panelists. Is there anything else that you might want to add? I would just say like, please don't delay care. You know, I think that I have some parents that have felt nervous about getting their kids vaccinated during this time. And I still feel like it's important and safe and that our offices are really safe to come to right now. So I think any reassurance that you all can offer in that regard is really helpful for us. Um, that it still is important to get that routine care. And if parents are nervous, we can do video visits and um, there are alternative ways to be getting care, um, but vaccinations are still super important as all of you know and understand. Josh, you had your hand up a moment ago. I'll just briefly, I'll just briefly add in uh, exactly um, uh, stuff that you guys see all the time and you all probably know about the research that um, DCF is getting far fewer calls than they have um, uh, previously based upon normal statistics for this time of year and that's thought to be because they're not seeing all of you um, and you're the front line of knowing whether kids are safe and reporting how they're doing and we certainly want to partner with you if you have any concerns about kids safety as they come back into the school environment um, and then also you know, recognizing that kids with complex health issues. Um, a lot of families are concerned that when they come into the medical setting, they may be more at risk. And so, uh, you know, that's the whole concern. The AAP yesterday put out a whole bunch of information about getting families back into uh, practices to make sure they aren't missing all the important care um, that was just commented on. So think about those two populations as well. Um, 
you know, the at-risk kids that you know really well and kids with complex health issues. And know that our nurses often are really happy to talk with you um, at any point uh, if you have concerns. We don't always necessarily need to see kids who love to partner with you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, are you recommending flu vaccines early this year is one of the questions. I'm going to let anybody jump right in there. You know, I, I, um, we are definitely recommending flu vaccines, um, for everyone. And, um, really or not, uh, we just want people to get in. Um, you know, in, in the adult literature, there's some suggestion that, um, you know, there's optimal timing around November and maybe if it's a late flu season, some immunity wanes. Um, the, there's not really that same data in kids and so you can extrapolate down, but, but it's hard to really know. And in general, um, I find the opposite problem that, you know, um, we generally start to vaccinate early as soon as we get the vaccines because it's it's just often much easier for families to get the vaccine while they're there and it becomes harder and sort of missed opportunities to bring people back in for some ideal time. So I generally am a proponent of vaccine early and recommend it to everybody. Thank you. Yeah, in our office, we're already doing some planning about how we can maximize the number of people getting flu vaccines this fall because we think it's going to be extremely important. And um, we do run clinics at our school-based health center for um, flu vaccines, so we're hoping to do that um, this year too. So it's definitely going to be incredibly important this year. Thank you. There was, there was some important information that came out early uh, in the data around COVID-19 that Kids coming from, uh, they were tested in China were positive. Um, maybe close to 40% of them were positive for other viruses. So it's also important to recognize that just because you have the flu, you don't necessarily, you don't necessarily not have COVID-19. Um, and early on, some people were, were thinking about that. Well, if you test them for the flu and they're positive, do we not have to worry about COVID-19? That's not um, a standard, of, uh, standard way of thinking. So we'll have to be very vigilant as we head into the school year, uh, uh, thinking about kids having multiple different diseases at once. So we do know, however, that if they're tested, if they're vaccinated for a flu, it gives us some reassurance that they're protected against a very serious disease that's highly likely to um, affect kids going into the winter. Uh, thank you. Um, along that line is, uh... Are, is there any expectation that children will be expected or are able to be tested for COVID-19 before they return to the school, in-school setting? And what are your thoughts on that? That's a great question. <laughs> we could probably all talk a long time about that because, because, you know, this is, this is evolving and um, there is a lot of discussion um, in all, you know, every time I have been at our noon calls or talking with the pediatric infectious disease specialists, there's a lot of talk about that. Um, and, and I know that, and I'm sure Brina, Dr. Brina Holmes, as she comes in um, from the Department of Health, they're um, talking to everyone about this as well. And, the challenges with COVID testing are that it's a um, PCR-based test that represents a single point in time. And so um, requiring or expecting that you would test everyone prior to entering school or work for that matter, because the same conversations are being had around um, testing folks in the workplace, including healthcare workers. Um, the information that you can really get from that is pretty limited. You can tell that at that moment in time, folks are not infected, but it, it doesn't 
really give you any information or confidence that days later, weeks later, that they would still be uninfected. And, and if it creates a false sense of security and, and causes some lapses in sort of general protection, you can imagine that um, that would not be good. And so um, my understanding of the current Department of Health um, recommendations is that they have testing at various pop-up sites for anyone who's asymptomatic. Um, and that includes they're welcoming all healthcare workers and childcare workers and school employees, um, but they are not recommending that all, for example, all school children be tested prior to entering the school because you just, it wouldn't necessarily tell you anything about the very next week unless you had some program where you were testing every three or four days or something, which um, is really challenging. Now, now, anyone who is symptomatic, we would want to test them. And, and there is currently enough testing supply to test anyone, kids included, really with any symptoms. And, and you know, as we've gone, we've learned more at least about the um, kids who have been sick across the country and the kids who have tested positive in Vermont. And there's, you know, there's really a, a, a broad range of symptoms. Um, I was just looking at the, um, the Vermont Department of Health released some information just earlier this week. Um, you know, 50%, no, 30% had fever um, and 50% had cough. So any symptoms, we definitely want to test the, the you know, testing, all kids who are asymptomatic prior to school is a pretty challenging topic, and it, it's it's hard to it's hard to make sense of that. So I know the Department of Health isn't recommending at this time, and it's something everyone's struggling with. Thank you, uh, Dr. Josh. Do you have anything you might want to add? Uh, no, I mean I I think from what Dr. Weinberger said. We'll know a lot more, I think, mid-summer. Um, there may also be some new information. I'm looking at the text box on the side. Um, so the different types of tests that are coming out uh, may change the way that we approach things. So right now, pretty much everyone gets tested with a test that goes through the nose to the back of the nose into the nasopharynx, the back of the throat. Fairly uncomfortable test. Um, uh, we think pretty soon there will be some availability of the front of the nose test where you don't have to be quite as invasive. And then there was a conversation yesterday with the Vermont Department of Health about whether we'll have throat swab testing coming down the road, um, kind of like getting a strep test. Um, there may be a bunch of questions also out there about antibody testing. A lot of people, that's been in the news a lot. You may develop antibodies when you've been sick. Um, we do not know yet, and I think my colleagues, unless they have different information on this, we don't know yet if that means you have long-term immunity. There was some information that came out just in the general news this past week about what's happened in the military and people getting sick and then testing positive again and so forth. Um, so we don't have a lot of good research on that. I think the one place where we might have some information or some thinking, I don't have an answer, about testing is in boarding schools. So if you're coming from out of state and you have a community that is um, essentially an enclosed community, a boarding school where when people arrive, they're not gonna be leaving that community, there may be some utility in testing in some kind of organized way as people enter the state. And then again, in some kind of periodic way, like a week or two down the road, recognizing that if people are going to get, to get sick during that period of time, that they'll test positive, then the boarding school could isolate those individual students, keep them separate from the rest of the boarding school population while um, they were moving through and working hand in hand with the Department of Health on how to do that. Th that may be one environment where the school has more control than a day school. Thank you. Related to testing, I saw a couple questions. You know, one was around um, the Abbott test being used at the pop-up sites and um, and you know, and and um, what if you're COVID negative but you still have symptoms? Um, your test comes back negative, but you still have symptoms. And I think those are related. You know, all these tests um, 
are not perfect. And in particular, you know, if you have symptoms, cough, fever, sore throat, and your test is positive, um, that, that represents probably COVID, that you can have some good reliability about that test. Um, but there is a problem with false negative tests, you know, and so um, if you, so, so one, it's important to recognize that the tests are not perfect. And if someone is sick with symptoms that could be consistent with COVID, um, cough, fever, sore throat, chills, aches, um, we have been advising families um, to follow the same guidance. You know, we know that the prevalence of COVID is relatively low and there are plenty of other things that could cause those symptoms, but, you know, we are saying, look, your test is negative, but you still need to wait till you're doing better before you re-enter society. Or, you know, my advice would be the same till you re-enter school, right? And, and the current guidance is 10 days from the start of your symptoms and three days post fever and improvement in all those other symptoms. So I think, you know, and that's a recognition that our testing is not perfect. Thank you. That uh, that response actually answered numerous questions. I think about how do we, what do we look for to bring a child back into the school if they've gone home um, for that. Now, Kathleen, what can you share with us about uh, what might be what you might expect to see in the school-based setting, um, and how the school nurses? What would you like to see from the school nurses? if they have expectations that a child might be uh, presenting COVID-like symptoms. Sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's similar to a lot of other illnesses. You know, I think you have to sort of remember that you guys are trained in, for years in recognizing when kids are sick and need to go home. And so I think that it is, it is pretty similar, fever, cough, um, just to be on high alert for those kinds of symptoms and calling parents and letting them know that you're concerned. Um, certainly, you know, in the setting of a school-based health clinic, if, if we're there and on site, we're happy to see those kids. Um, chances are we won't be able to do COVID testing in the office because we currently aren't doing that in the office. It's all being done in a separate location, um, but we can certainly order that. Um, and then, you know, excluding kids when they need to be excluded. So I think it is similar to other infectious diseases that you guys see all the time. Um, and it'll be the same kind of guidelines for when to exclude them from school. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That kind of leads me to ask another question that seems to be popping up a lot. And we've been hearing a lot about PPE and its unavailability for uh, frontline workers. What are your thoughts and expectations for what's happening in your clinics? What are you using for PPE when you're seeing kids? And what would you recommend for school nurses to, um, in their health office, to be keeping themselves safe when you're dealing with the uh, constant germs. Um, Dr. Josh, is that something you would like to address? Sure. Um, so I think currently uh, the feeling would be that in mean, some special situations I'm thinking about in a uh, clinic, you're, you're paying mostly attention to aerosolizing situations and someone asked on the um, chat box what if a kid is coughing should you have an n95 mask um so I, i'm not exactly sure partly because uh, that would mean that probably all of you are going to need n95 masks because you're all going to see coughing kids and you're all going to have to do something about rotating uh use of the n95 mask uh through the course of your school year meaning you can't use one mask and definitely there are hospitals using cleaning techniques so that you can use the same mask. So I will simply say that that is a pending question that we may not have good guidance on yet. Currently what we're doing in the office is that we use PPE, including mask, face shield, gloves, and uh, um, a gown for anyone that we have sort of suspicion could have the symptoms of 
COVID-19, which would be cough um, specifically, and then the other symptoms that were discussed. Um, we only use the N95 mask for if we're doing something aerosolizing to the kid, which would you know, be doing a test, which we are not doing in our office, but um, deferring to the local um, drive-by site. Um, and uh, one of the things that we've done is eliminate aerosolizing nebulizer treatments in our office as much as possible, and we're just using inhalers. Now, some of you may have patients that need nebulizers um, or get those treatments during the day, and the recommendation has been trying to minimize that. So if you can switch over or partner with the practice near you or uh, your student's um, clinic on making sure that they have inhalers or seeing if they can use inhalers instead of a nebulizer in those situations may be hard. Um, I guess there might be the other situation of kids with cystic fibrosis who might get something like a vest or respiratory treatments during the day with you. That would be a special consideration and you want to talk to their pulmonologist about that. I know that doesn't get the exact answer. It's probably still in a bit of uh, evolution here on what will be the recommendation for each of you on the N95 mask. Uh, thank you very much. I just want to respond to uh, someone asked about the FIT test for N95s. The VSSNA Executive Board is also a member of the newest uh, Vermont Nurse Leader Task Force or a coalition, and we are working with uh, local hospitals to partner in getting that testing done. Um, so stay tuned for that, nurses. Um, so I'm wondering also, um, trying to, I'm trying to stay on these questions here. Um, what are your thoughts and recommendations for um, face ma facial coverings for students uh, when they return to school? I know that this has been bantered around in many of our uh, uh, many of our other meetings, and one we don't know what the fall will look like. We're kind of being told that adults can expect to um, be wearing facial coverings uh, and lots of concerns about students. Kathleen, do you have any thoughts um, that you could share with us there? Yeah, I mean, having read over some of the daycare recommendations that have come out recently in Vermont, I mean, I think it's gonna be pretty similar. Again, two months is a long time. Things may change between now and August. Um, but currently the recommendation is that kids age two and up wear a cloth mask. Um, and so I'm imagining that it'll be a similar recommendation for schools in the fall. Um, so yeah, I think it's evolving and we don't have the answer to that yet. Um, but I think that probably will end up being a recommendation. Thank you. I have just received a notice that we have two additional panelists joining us. One is, um, Sorry, I can't remember the, Let's see if I can go back here. Dr. Davidson, and the other is Dr. Holmes. I'm assuming you have let them in, Clayton. I'm in, hi. All right, hi, Brina. <laughs> um, so, um, Needless to say, there are tons of questions about thermometers that keep coming up. So um, for the most part, I just want to have an answer for uh, what thermometer you are using or if you are recommending um, a thermometer. I don't want to spend the rest of the time on the thermometer. I think we can answer that question best with um, follow-up email response to our questions uh, that, and this may continue to change. So, um, Brina, you're here. Do you want me to just let you have that thermometer question? Well, sure, but I want to say hi to all my uh, medical colleagues. I yes, see Kathleen. Please. Hi, Kathleen. I see Stan and Josh. Who else? I'm just happy to see you all. Thanks for, um, being on today, this this group of school nurses is uh, 
passionate and important and the health department team has been joining as much as we can. We've got our state school nurse consultant, Sharon Lee Treffrey, and this is, um, these partnerships between pediatricians and uh, child health providers and communities and school nurses is going to be the key to opening schools. It's, and I, just to be my own beautiful day, passionate self, where it's not if we're opening, it's when. We're, we're, we're opening schools this fall. So <laughs> that's just my passion spot today. I don't, I, I, we'll figure out a way to do it, but we got to do it. So uh, thermometers, well, Let's talk, uh, as we did last week, Soph, that um, the decision to do health checks is currently our approach and our guidance for child care and summer programs. That decision is not without uh, scent, and it is more than a temperature. As you know, a health check is screening questions of kids and their caregivers and just getting everybody level set at the very beginning of the morning. Do you feel, do you feel all right? <laughs> Have you had any of these symptoms? And the list of symptoms is long. It's not cough, fever, shortness of breath anymore. It's much longer. Or have you been in touch with anyone who's got COVID? Or do you have, have you been in touch with people that don't feel well? So I just want to make sure people remember health screening is not the temperature. So then you move into taking a temperature. And uh, I think Stan, I'm looking at Stan, that we know from our pediatric experience so far in Vermont, it's only 30% of kids present with fever. So let's not overstate the role that temperature check plays, but it's still in our childcare work, which we've been doing all along. We, we stood up emergency childcare the day childcare closed. So we have March, April, and May in our back pocket as experience. There were kids with feet that got uh, were over 100.4 and went home. And also our, our providers feel it's a, it's a nexus of control. It feels a little bit better than doing nothing. So that was too much of a preamble, but, and then you need thermometers. So the CDC recommends, they always use these words, when feasible, when possible, whenever possible, the no touch thermometers for sort of obvious germ infectious control reasons, but we're having tons of trouble with supply. So I do have good news from the Child Development Division has figured out a supply of thermometers that's going to get uh, into the hands of our providers, child care providers opening June 1st. And I can get, so if I can get you that information to see if that's a lot on, on, you know, we're not recommending brands. We're not getting in the business of which ones. Uh, I was hopeful you guys already all had them. We do have thermometers, <laughs> different kinds, and I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think the question keeps coming up because people want to make sure that we're doing the right thing. Yeah, and maybe wants a better one, like a. I shouldn't say better, but wants a no-touch one. Do you think? And you know, I. But by the way, I think it was with you guys. Maybe it wasn't. No, it was with chocolate providers. I didn't know what no-touch. You guys know what it means, right? It's this. It's, it's literally no touch, kind of high tech. I would say that one of the things that's come up is the fact that um, we have, if you have a large school, taking a temperature of every student with only having one or two thermometers is going to be problematic. And so it's getting the amount of thermometers required to support this um, in all the different schools across the state. Right. Well, let's air it out with this group the way I always do. Like maybe we're not doing temperature checks, right? Maybe we're doing what a lot of states are doing, which is parents check your own kids at home, but we could still imagine a world of a health check where you're checking in with a kid in the morning and, and saying, uh, how are you feeling? And my, I think I told you guys last week, my, I have a lot of states that I admire in their way they approach public health and school nursing. One of them is Maryland. And my Maryland friends, they're not going to do just give you a little insider baseball. They're not going to do um, temperature checks in schools in the fall. They're going to rely on parents, which is, it's interesting philosophic conversation about our parents. And, you know, I've, I'm a strength-based person. I believe people are doing the best they can. So if people say they have a fever, then I'm, I'm okay with that. But a lot of people are pushing back on me saying kids to school because we have terrible paid leave and our, you know, we're not a society that allows for kids and parents to be home when they're not well. 
But don't you guys think that's changing with COVID? Aren't we in a new world where we can, we can build better infectious disease prevention strategies for all infections, not just COVID? Let's hope so. That, that's sort of my, my personal bent is we're all professionals in the, the adults that work in the schools and the parents, we have to err on the side of they really want what's best for their child. And if we approach things in that manner, it sounds like, um, I mean, you guys all do that in your offices. Why can't we do that in our offices too? <laughs> really, we're there for the, the whole group. So um, Dr. Davidson, we haven't heard from you. I'd like to ask you a question that, um, has come up several times. Are there any rules that may be changing for students who have exemptions from vaccines for religious or other reasons that we might be seeing as we return to school? So if I, um, I think she oh. might have dropped off the call. I apologize. I'm sorry, I, I just still on. see that. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, Kathleen, is that something you might be able to answer for us? I can try. I mean, I don't think that there will be any changes. I mean, I think that um, I think that was your question, right? Are there going to be some changes because yes. of this? And I don't foresee that. I mean, I think that we all need to continue to advocate for immunizations like we've always been doing, and um, even stronger than ever. Um, just because if we can prevent these um, vaccine preventable diseases, I think that's going to be super important in the time of COVID. So. That's the message I've been trying to give my parents and families when I do see them, if they're vaccine hesitant, is that there's never been a more important time to vaccinate your children than now. Um, and so I think that we just need to continue to do that and advocate for that. But I don't foresee there being any um, changes in requirements in the future. Okay. Thank you for that. Dr. Weinberger, there's a question that um, you can probably answer this. I have a question about how to treat families with illegal immigration status and developing a trusting relationship. What resources, if any, including outside agencies to help provide protection? It's my understanding reportable communicable diseases such as SARS, TB, and COVID-19, then the BDH would have a responsibility to report them to immigration and wondering if that will deter them from seeking care and what effect that would have on the healthcare provider, both the school nurse and the uh, primary care. Right, uh, great questions. Um, you know, we, I mean, in general, and I, I have the benefit to work with a, a social worker who helps me with this population, but you know, the, they are certainly um, a great risk. You know, there's, there's data from around the country that um, kids and adults in different ethnic minorities um, might be at higher risk for COVID complications um, and also have less access to testing and care and might be reluctant to provide that care. And, and, um, I think it's important to know that um, right now, um, and this is an important thing for all of us to be advocating, is that um, you know, one, you know, costs incurred by COVID um, are not costs that families are res are um, responsible for. So, testing uh, is free for families, including those who don't have any insurance. Um, and that, um, and in general, um, we, and, and, and in general, you know, when, when we have trusting relationships with families, um, I always ask them to, you know, what are your concerns so that I can make sure that I'm addressing them and either um, we're able to provide information that is reassuring or, take their concerns into account um, as we go about the, you know, figuring out with the family, how can we keep your kids safe? How can we, how can we help you? Um, you know, having parents or kids deported is never in the health of children. Um, 
So, um, and Brina, you may be able to answer, but right, as COVID is reportable, is there a requirement that immigration, are, are we co collecting immigration status as you would report the COVID case? No. I don't think that we are. No. Yeah. I don't think that's a question that's we're, actually We're not, I anymore. just, this is some, um, I mean, I can confirm more about this whole lane. This is a really thoughtful question and super important, uh, you know, that I hadn't put, I haven't thought about. So I will confirm that. I know for sure we're not asking in the testing paperwork because I'm familiar with the testing paperwork. But in terms of uh, just a broader system around these uh, families I, and, and what we're hearing, and I'm wondering if the question came from someone's experience with something. It's just very specific. So if, if we want to take it offline, we can with some specific details. One thing I, I will say is that, you know, <clears throat> many, many, if not most families um, who are not citizens, whether they're it's legal immigration or illegal immigration have a lot of heightened anxiety right now because there is also a lot of misinformation around immigration status, um, fear of deportation, appropriately so. Um, and so, you know, it's also important to, um, you know, when we, when we know those answers and we can say, yeah, that, you know, the testing, we don't, we don't need to know your immigration status. We don't care. We just want to make sure your child's safe um, to let families know that, or this does not affect your immigration status. Because um, what I've found, and even patients who right now are now citizens, there still is an overwhelming fear that they will be sent back or deported, even though you know they, there might be no chance of that. Because that's what they're hearing publicly. Thank you. Go ahead, Josh. It's so fun. I don't want to commandeer the process here, but there's a really important question in the chat box that I want to answer before too long um, about symptoms. So we're producing a document today about for parents, but also for the rest of us, about all the physical symptoms that would mean you can't go to school or childcare, and then the few circumstances in which we, you're fine to go, one of which is seasonal allergies, which requires a connection with medical home. And I, you know what? There's no required letters. I don't want to put a burden on my pediatric colleagues that they have to write clearance letters. It's just a conversation between the medical home and the child care provider that Johnny's got seasonal allergies. I know his, his nose drips. It's good. And the second condition is asthma. If mild and well controlled, it, asthma's on every list of no fly zone for COVID. But, but in kids, it, you know, we have tons of kids who have mild intermittent asthma that are well controlled and they can go to childcare and school, but they need the partnership with the doc or the nurse practitioner. We need it to be a thing that somebody's talking with each other. And I would rather it just be co co collegial the way I want you all to have medical colleagues out in your community that are your go-to people. So it got really screwed up. People start in other states, they started requiring waivers and letters small enough we should just say Johnny's got asthma he, he hasn't been on steroids for six years he's totally fine he takes an intermittent inhaler off he goes um, but thank two you things, asthma and seasonal allergies. yeah thank you dr. Holmes um, I'm gonna put my plug in here that every physician wants to make sure that there's a full-time school nurse in their schools so that they don't have people freaking out about those very things um, and that collegial relationship can continue um, Dr. Josh, I think you had a uh, something you wanted to know. Okay. I am going to ask you a question, Dr. Josh. Um, we talked about asthma and seasonal allergies, but what about your uh, children that have other chronic diseases such as diabetics? Um, how, what kind of advice would you give to those students and families and um, are they, should they be returning to in-person instruction? Yeah, I, I guess I'd think about it. I, I haven't been deep in this conversation other than here in our office, um, but I guess I'd think about it the same way that um, Dr. Holmes just brought up the issue of well-controlled uh, asthma, right? So if you have patients who have comp 
complex healthcare issues and they're stable with good control, um, that, you know, for instance, someone with diabetes, um, you're going to want to, we're going to want to be partnering with their specialists, their endocrinologists to, to think about that. Um, but if their diabetes is under really good control, they're going to be at the same risk probably if they get sick, like they would any other year um, when you guys were taking care of one of your students at school and they came down with an illness, you'd have to make sure that they're checking their, you know, glucose is more frequently checking for ketones, talking with their specialist, making sure that they're under good control. So I, I don't think that will change the situation for those individuals. Um, it may, I saw something in the comment um, uh, list about maybe kids with trachs or kids who need frequent suctioning, um, managing, you know, fixed secretions. Uh, certainly, uh, at least from what I understand about the data so far about kids, kids with complex health issues and issues like that are going to be kind of our highest risk kids, certainly very young kids, but also kids with those kinds of respiratory conditions. So I suspect we'll get more guidance, but my biggest concern, I guess, would be those kids with airway abnormalities or trachs. And I don't know, Dr. Holmes, if you have any sense of what's been happening in the conversation around those kids. Yeah, 100% agree with everything you said, Josh. There are, there's a small but important group of kids that can't go to school this fall. And I don't want to sugarcoat that. Um, it, and it's the opposite of all of our principles about inclusion. And it just doesn't feel good. But if you're a highly, um, if you have respiratory condition, including trach, like that's the, talk about aerosolized particles. I mean, um, that's, it's high risk for the child at, you know, in the center. And then it's high, it's really high risk for all the caregivers. And that's not going to work just short term. You know, we're just, we're just going to go week by week here and figure out where we are with this virus. But it's, uh, it's important for you to be thinking about all of this and keep asking us to, specifics about kids and their diagnoses. I think Josh's answer about diabetes is spot on. Cystic fibrosis is another one that's coming up in the chat box. Kids with cystic fibrosis obviously are on the list for having chronic lung disease, but they're, they're, um, we need to make that decision with pediatric pulmonologists because there's actually some interesting early data about pediatric kids, you know, about cases around the country that kids with cystic fibrosis are not highly susceptible to this virus. Now, it doesn't mean they can't get it and nothing's perfect, but it we need to do risk benefit analyses with every kid uh, in, in this. And ideally this would be going on through some care coordination through the summer, right? Thinking about the fall. Thank you. Yeah, I can just say like, we've been having a lot of these conversations already with parents when they come in. And so I think it's just ongoing conversations with their primary care providers and the specialists and just stressing that to families. Um, that it needs to be shared decision making, which isn't easy and takes a lot of time, but I think that's what's going to need to happen. Thank you. Um, Kathleen, I have another question that I think um, we can address to you. Should school nurses feel empowered to advise families for how long students will need to stay home based on recommendations from the health department or the CDC, or should they be referred to their primary care? Um, provider? No, I think they can follow the guidelines from the CDC and the Department of Health. I think that those are going to be standard and certainly those of us in primary care are going to be following those guidelines as well. So I think that we're all going to be on the same page about that and nurses should definitely feel empowered to follow those guidelines. Thank you. Can I, can I ask something? Um, yes, please. This conversation with Dr. Holmes and the rest of us. Um, this came up before, but it came up before Dr. Holmes joined us. I, I, I see this loud and clear, and it came up in the medical community over the last few months, um, where people are seeing a lot of very sick patients with COVID-19, whether they have appropriate PPE. And I'm hearing a lot of concern from you as a group that you have kids walking through the door, and you'd be surrounded by people coughing. Um, and it puts you at risk as individuals and how we should manage that best for you. And I agree with you that we have more control in our office. Um, and so uh, I don't know how to answer that question exactly, but, but when someone brought up the question before about N95 masks, you know, there's always this balance here in the conversation around whether we have enough PPE for the medical community. Um, we haven't really 
uh, as well, far as I understand on our conversations, um, but I haven't been a part of all of them at the Vermont Department of Health, delved into the issue of when we get back into school, you guys will be just as in the thick of things as the medical community, potentially, maybe the first line before they get to the medical community and how we think about the PPE shortage versus protecting you all so that you can continue to do your work. Um, I think that question around the N95 mask is a really strong one when you have um, people coming in with illness. So uh, I think currently our thinking would be you wouldn't need an N95 unless you're doing some kind of procedure on that kid, um, but you should always be wearing masks just to, to address what people are asking out there along the side. Thank you. are muted, Josh. D Dr. Holmes, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, just, just, it's complicated, uh, but I do, though, I'm happy to hear that this uh, school nurse, the Vermont State School Nurse Association it has a subgroup on PPE because it needs, um, needs clarity, it needs protocol. And you know, I'm seeing Claire, I completely, so I think Josh did mean you're part of the medical community. I mean, you are the extension of the medical home and you would be uh, in the same supply chain as medical folks. That's, that's good news because supply chains for people that have great exposure but don't cl uh, classify as a medical professional is, is, is harder. So I, of course you're in the medical home supply chain or the medical community supply chain. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be this complex assessment of no sick kids in school. You know, like it isn't going to be, I know you're picturing your life last winter and all that coughing and all that respiratory illness but there, that isn't going to be, I mean, just, I'm going to be Pollyanna for a second. That's not going to be in the school because the kids, sick kids are staying home, but then you, of course kids are going to develop symptoms during the day and you're going to need protection. So and isolate, I mean, you guys have thought this all through so beautifully. It's not just protection, it's isolation. Where are these kids gonna sit when you're waiting for someone to come get them? And also, um, you know, I, I feel like there's September or August, and then there's what we all know is like November, and when influenza and some of the other more traditional respiratory pathogens hit the community. And that, that's how the national folks are thinking. They're thinking about like a, a subset of like the first 10 weeks. Strong on that, but anyway, um, it's super important. So we have just uh, four minutes left. I'm wondering, uh, Kathleen, anything you wanna share? I think just that, I mean, things are going to change over the next few months and um, guidelines are going to become clearer and that we all need to continue to be part of these conversations and work together. So, um, you know, I love partnering with my school nurses. I think they're really important. They're the eyes and ears on these kids. They see them every day. And, um, and so please reach out to us and we'll do the same with you and we'll just keep, keep figuring this out as we go along this summer. Thank you so much. Dr. Weinberger. Well said. I would say the same. Yeah. Um, we will continue to figure it out. I know we are figuring it out here as we go and it seems to always change as we learn more and um, and that's that's how we'll end up the, as safe as we can for our kids and ourselves this fall is by just working together as we go and as we learn more. Thank you. Dr. Josh. Yeah, I just want to clarify, I did not mean to offend anyone. I, in no way do I not think that you're part of the medical community. I, um, I, what I think what I was really trying to say was the infrastructure of hospitals and clinics uh, where we can prepare um, more easily. Um, uh, we work uh, every day with our local school nurses and we are fully aware that they are part of the medical community. So I apologize, but, um, and I, I uh, echo what, everyone else has said really appreciate all the work you're doing it does seem like a daily on daily basis even in the last few months we're trying to work through mental health issues for kids at our local schools getting them meals 
we've really tried to be open and dynamic with um, the school nursing staff. And um, we take it very seriously when you identify um, kids who need our care that we're not seeing. So um, please keep us in the loop. Thanks. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I saw a note here, Sharon Lee Treffrey, our school nurse consultant, state school nurse consultant is uh, in our group here. And Sharon Lee, you asked to say a few words. Thank you all. This looks like a great meeting. I look forward to seeing some of the feedback um, afterwards. I apologize. I was involved in some other, in my other work um, for joining late. The conversation around kids with special needs, I have learned that um, Alaska is doing a pilot project on specifically for a small group of students with special needs um, that will take very, very close clinical observation and management in their classroom. So that pilot project, I believe, is starting this week. Um, we will we look forward to gaining information from them. And um, your conversation is on the topic of many national colleagues' uh, interest. And uh, NASN and NASNIC met last night. We will be specifically a small team will be working on uh, PPE guidance around the high needs situations as in aerosolized uh, care. Um, and we'll keep you posted. So thank you all for working together. Thank on you this. very much. It's the only way we'll accomplish. We're all in this together, aren't we? Dr. Holmes, do you have any final yeah. words for us? We're almost out of time. Uh, I'm just so happy to see my pediatric colleagues. I, I, I wonder, I mean, th these are your school health champions, just and there are a few more too, of course, but um, really growing this panel and getting us a nice little cohort. I'm, I'm advocating, as you know, Friday with the Secretary of Education that we need a task force for reopening schools, primary care, pediatric infectious disease, epidemiologist school. You cut out on us, Sabrina. Okay, I'm not sure if we're going to get her back, but I can uh, feel pretty confident that her final statement was school nurses need to be on that task force as well. Um, so I want to thank everybody for being here. We're so appreciative of the time that our uh, presenters have given us. And uh, the questions are great. So those of you, if you had a specific question and it was not answered, please know that we will continue to answer those questions and get both the recording of this meeting as well as the uh, questions and answers posted to our website as soon as possible. Continue to send questions to us at COVID-19 at bssna.org. Um, and I want to make a shout out to our uh, guest next week will be a school nurse uh, from Sweden, I think, Denmark. Sorry, I should have looked that up. School nurse from Switzerland. Her Switzerland. name is um, <laughs> Cynthia. <laughs> yeah, Cynthia. And she's at the International School of, um, I'm going to mess it up, Lund London. Anyway, she'll be here to discuss the European coalition that has been working toward reentry, and they started school last week. It'll be good to hear from her. Again, thank you all very much, and we look forward to uh, our continued working with you. Thank you.